Okay, so I think we'll get going. Um, so our next speaker is Robin Bloom. She's from uh, Michigan State University, and she's going to talk to us about dual process theories and the taxonomy of psychology. Thank you. Um, I also want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. I've been really excited about this, and it's definitely living up to my expectations. I'm having a great time. And I'm so pleased I'm going to be finished with my talk after this so I can just sit back and enjoy tomorrow and Sunday. <laughs> uh, before I start, I just want to maybe put a couple of caveats out there. So first of all, like Adina, I took the workshop designation of this event very seriously. So this is very much a work in progress. Um, I say this in part to um, cover my butt in case I say things that are really dumb. I think well, I've just started thinking about this. But also because I, I genuinely am really excited to uh, get feedback from people. Um, the second caveat is that this is very much a philosophy talk. Uh, so especially those of you who are not philosophers, you're going to have to sort of reboot your minds and, and think about something uh, very different. Um, Part of the reason you're going to know that this is a philosophy talk is that there are no pictures in my slides. <laughs> if that irritates you, just be grateful that I'm not standing up here like this reading a paper. Because <laughs> we, we've come a long way as a discipline in the last few years. <laughs> there, there's no guarantee that uh, philosophers will actually have slides at all. So, um, My talk is structured, and I use the term structured reasonably loosely, around two questions. First of all, I want to think about what kind of cognitive taxonomy is suggested by work on dual process theories. So given the research that's going on, what kinds of things are they thinking about in terms of the taxonomies underlying these processes? And then second, how might these dual process theories be realized in the brain? And I know realized is kind of an odd term, implemented. Um, what, what's going on in the brain when we think in these two ways that can be pro that can be categorized in um, type 1 or type 2 processes. Um, and not to give away the punchline, but the answer to question 1 is nobody really knows. The answer to question 2 is nobody's really thinking about it. <laughs> so after giving you the longer version of those answers, I will at the end of the talk say a little bit about how I think it might be plausible and fruitful to answer these questions. And to do that, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about dual process theories, identifying three different interpretations of what the dual process approach is actually doing. And these are roughly chronological. Um, the beginning was um, uh, taking into account these, um, they, 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 they describe the two processes in terms of a family resemblance, and that term comes from um, Richard Samuels. Then there was a switch from talking about dual processes to talking about dual systems, and I'll say a bit more about that. And then most recently, there's been a backing away from the discussion of systems and talking instead about the essential characteristics of the two types of processing and then certain amounts of variability. And then moving on to the neuroscience question, I'll talk a little bit about one way of understanding what's going on in the brain when we have these two processes occurring uh, that emphasizes conflict and comes mostly from neuroimaging research. And then I'll sketch out a possible alternative um, to this competitive approach. So to start, uh, work on dual process theories in psychology started in the 1960s. It has developed independently in a variety of different areas of psychology. Uh, so for example, in the study of learning, um, originally, I guess, learning theorists were looking at explicit, um, conscious, deliberate attempts to learn and found that a lot of learning actually occurs, occurs implicitly without any effort at all. And so that was one of the earliest um, incarnations of, of dual processes. Other work was done uh, looking at deductive reasoning. So we're all capable of reasoning deductively, at least at a fairly simple level, but we tend to make characteristic mistakes, and um, the argument was that these mistakes are the result of a different kind of processing. Uh, social cognition was next, and this is an area in which dual process theories have become extremely influential. And then finally, um, decision making and judgment. So this comes out of some of the heuristics and biases literature. And unlike these other areas, which apparently did develop very independently without a lot of um, theoretical discussion between the areas, 
uh, some of the decision-making literature actually became solidified by looking at some of the theoretical discussion of dual processes coming out of these other areas. Um, this phase of research, or this earlier phase of research, focused very much on just gathering empirical data and doing things to try to understand the circumstances under which the different processes got used. So they would do things like, uh, in the experiments, very, the um, instructions of the task, uh, control for the amount of attention people were able to pay, uh, looking at motivation and at ability as well. So um, in particular, the type two system is associated with general intelligence. So there was some idea that there was a varying, um, there was an effect of varying ability. Another distinction that got made during this time was uh, between the two processes themselves and then modes of processing. So the modes of processing refers more to cognitive style. So some people tend to rely more on intuition and others tend to try to be slower, more careful thinkers. And this phase was largely descriptive. So it was determined that these two processes could be characterized. They were grouped broadly into type one processes, which tended to be very quick to occur automatically, uh, to be implicit rather than explicit and effortful, and of course, if they're not effort effortful, they can be unconscious. By contrast, type two processes are slower, they're deliberate, they involve um, explicit processing, and they're under conscious control. And again, these are descriptive. Um, it, it, it's a descriptive designation. They're not really talking at this point about how these processes work or how they interact or what is actually going on. They're just noticing that um, in the data there are these different response tendencies that can be characterized by some of these adjectives. And after a while, people started instead to think about how these two different processes were implemented at a cognitive level, and then there was discussion of not dual processes, but dual systems. So moving on, uh, in a volume, an edited volume, their introduction, Frankish and Evans say that these dual process theories distinguish between the different kinds of processes, and then I've added these italics. Dual system theories attribute the origin of these processes to two distinct cognitive systems. And again, Samuels talks in terms of cognitive mechanisms, but the idea is that the reason that we have type one processes on the one hand and type two processes on the other is that there is a dis uh, distinct form of cognitive processing or distinct mechanisms. And based on that, and on further empirical research, the two systems got designated again by a list of characteristics. So a lot of these are similar to the ones that I put up in first introducing the two processes. Uh, type one is fast, type two is slow, type one is intuitive, type two is reflective. But they also built in the idea that type one processes are evolutionarily older uh, and shared with animals, whereas type Two processes are more recent and are uniquely or distinctively human or maybe best developed in humans if we want to be a little bit more modest about it. So even with this new development of two systems rather than two processes, there really isn't a lot of work in cashing out what the different cognitive mechanisms actually are or what the different systems actually are. And in fact, from what I've been able to tell, most of the discussion of what the systems are has to do with responding to critics of this idea by stipulating what the two systems aren't. And, oh, I need to actually say that, but I'll go back to it. Um, one point that critics have raised and that the people who defend dual systems approach uh, say is actually a straw man is that the claim is that the brain has only two systems, which of course is not very plausible. Uh, Samuel suggests that we can understand this a little bit more charitably, saying that the claim is actually relevant to a certain level of analysis, so we can identify two systems that can then be further decomposed or um, that you know, don't cover every possible way that we can parse out what's going on in the brain. But in general, the idea that the brain has only two systems is not, again, very plausible. In fact, it's kind of ridiculous. Another supposed straw man um, way of understanding the dual systems is that all of the properties 
in this list have to co-occur. So uh, people have suggested that essentially in order to be a system one process, a process has to have absolutely all of these characteristics. Uh, if it doesn't have even one of them, it's not going to count as a type one pro or system one process, similar, similarly for system two. And again, the people who were developing this theory thought that that was not a very charitable or useful way of understanding what they were trying to talk about. Another question that came up at this time is the question of how the systems are related. So one possibility, and I think that this is really consistent with the stronger versions of the evolutionary claim that type one processes or system one are evolutionarily much older, um, is that the systems function in parallel and they compete. And there's certainly a lot of empirical evidence to show that we can have two different response tendencies. So there's some cases in which it does seem clear that system one and system two are in, in some sense in competition. More recently, people have moved to what they call a default interventionist or interactive approach in which the systems actually can, in some cases, work together uh, and that the um, competitive approach is, while uh, experimentally very useful in some situations, only getting at a fair, fairly, uh, only getting at a minority of instances in which the systems are, are working. So given that we don't really have a good, characteri uh, good characterization of what the systems are like that um, really fleshes out and gives an explanation for the descriptive data that I talked about in phase one, more recently people who are writing about this have moved to what I'm thinking of as phase three, which is a situation in which these Characteristics can occur in different combinations. There's some variability, but different authors are wanting to say that there is still an essential characteristic that belongs to each system. So in terms of variability, people are saying that there are multiple type one systems or type one processes, and here the terminology is not always used consistently. Um, one of the interesting things about this is that it allows people to make claims that incorporate different kinds of type 1 processes. So some of them are supposed to be innate and hardwired. Others are sort of hardwired, but still flexible and modifiable by experience. And yet other type 1 processes are actually completely the result of experience, but they're so well learned that they become intuitive or they become automatic. And Stanovich refers to this as the autonomous set of systems. So I sort of picture this as a whole bunch of little bubbles or modules at the type one level. And then for a while, there was the idea that system two is general. <coughs> but now, again, there's the idea that type two processes or system two can be broken down as well. So Stanovich distinguishes between the algorithmic and the reflective minds. The algorithmic mind processes things in sort of the Mars middle level kind of algorithmic way or the um, kind of box and arrow diagrams that you will get in some cognitive psychology um, papers. The reflective mind is actually sort of monitoring what's going on. It's definitely a system two or a type two process, but um, it's distinct from the algorithmic mind. And it also monitors type one processing and figures out when system two and the algorithmic careful, explicit, conscious approach needs to step in and override the automatic type one approach. Similarly, Evans says that there's various type two systems, so for example, for reading, for deductive reasoning, for memory retrieval, but he then goes on to say that type two systems actually do have an essential characteristic, which is that they draw on working memory. And he defines type one processes as systems that, or processes that don't draw on working memory. So for him, working memory is the defining feature of system two. Stanovich talks about type two processes as involving what he calls cognitive decoupling. So this is the idea that we can, using system two processes, entertain hypothetical situations and counterfactuals. We can think about different possibilities that are not directly connected to sensory or motor um, immediate situations. Type one processes for him, their defining characteristic is that they're autonomous. So I am the kind of philosopher of science that gets really uncomfortable with talk about essences, but I do want to say right now that I think that they're on the right track, more or less. 
So going back to question one, I think that our best shot at coming up with a cognitive taxonomy that is true to the data from dual process research and that is um, useful for understanding the neuroscience is to think in terms of maybe not essential processes, but processes that do tend to um, occur in different types of type 1 or different types of type 2 processing. And that brings us to question 2, which is what is the neuroscience of dual process theories? And there seems to be surprisingly little work done on this, and the work that is being done does not engage very deeply with the theoretical discussion in the psychology literature. So they're sort of, they sort of seem to be at the stage of putting people in the scanner, running a paradigm, and seeing what lights up. And even though there's very little work being done and very little crosstalk between the neuroscientists and the psychologists, there is a really strong sense among the dual process theorists who've really been thinking about um, sort of the meta-level questions in their field, that there are different neural implementations. So Evans, in a 2012 paper, says that um, the types are uh, proce the processes occur in fundamentally distinct cognitive symptoms, and that this sim symptoms, that's got to be the best Freudian slip I've ever made, uh, systems, <laughs> implying also different neural systems. And then he goes on to say, hence we can make the strong claim that the types of processing differ at what Marr would call the implementation level. So even though they're not necessarily focused on the neuroscience underlying type 1 processing and type 2 processing, they do think that at some point the neuroscientists are going to out. And I also just want to point out that they're really talking in terms of sort of classical cognitive science vocabulary. So they talk about algorithms and implementations. Uh, they talk about uh, computation. So they're, they're really sort of rooted in that kind of broad cognitive science overarching paradigm. And in that same paper, um, Evans suggests that there's an emerging consistent neural imaging literature. They, he cites, I think he also cites a 2009 paper by Lieberman on social cognition, but he really doesn't do a broad survey of the literature. He just picks a few things that look at the neuroscience of dual processing using neuroimaging. And what he concludes is that, first of all, the primary findings are that when system one and system two are active together, the anterior cingulate is active and that this is interpreted as um, reflecting a conflict between type one and type two processing. And then he says neuroimaging can also tell us which type of process wins the argument and controls the behavior. So in other words, different bits of the brain light up when we give answers consistent with type one processing than light up when we give uh, answers consistent with type two processing. And I just want to point out that this is very much in line with the parallel compatibility competitive model of the relationship between the two kinds of process rather than the default interventionist, which Evans himself tends to accept. Um, so I, I don't really know how he reconciles this competitive aspect. Uh, and also that it's implying that there are two distinct neural systems. So even though it was a straw man argument to say that there are only two systems in the brain, the idea is that, uh, or two systems in the mind, I guess, the idea here is that we can identify two distinct systems in the brain, one that's active during type one processing, one that's active during type two processing. But interestingly, in an earlier paper, Evans seems to be telling a different story. So he cites a review article by Reinhard Goel on deductive reasoning, it's called the anatomy of deductive reasoning, I believe. Uh, and he says that this review suggests what he, uh, Evans calls an anarchic view that there's no consistency among studies, neuroimaging studies of reasoning. And he draws the conclusion there that there is, it appears that there is no neural center for reasoning. So I don't know what happened between 2009 and 2012 to make him shift like this. I think this is actually much closer to the truth, um, that there doesn't seem to be consistency in the literature, even though um, there are certain things that occur often enough, like the anterior cingulate being active during conflict, that it seems reasonable to pick it out as something that's emerging from the literature. Um, and I also want to point out that 
this anarchic view is a much stronger conclusion than Gould himself draws in the paper. He says that you know there is inconsistency, but there are certain trends that are emerging that are useful. So, going back to question two, how might dual process theories be realized at the level of neural function? The answer again is that nobody appears to really be thinking too much about it. There's a bit of neuroscience going on, mostly in imaging but there isn't really a robust theoretical discussion that links up with the robust theoretical discussion that's going on in psychology. But I actually think that there's another source of evidence re related to dual process theories that is going to be much more useful than the limited discussion that's going on. So this is where I'm sort of shifting from just surveying what other people are saying to thinking about how we might actually use resources from the literature to rethink what's happening. And this comes from uh, a literature on the neuroscience of moral judgment, which is also actually largely centered around a dual process theory. But again, there's very little uh, crosstalk or cross citation between the work that I've been talking about up to now and the research being done on the neuroscience of moral judgment. So just to pause, how many of you are familiar broad brush strokes with Green's theory? A few people, a few people not, okay. So basically uh, what happened is in 2001, Josh Green published a paper in Science, which is an amazing feat considering that at the time he was a PhD student in philosophy. Uh, he managed to find somebody who would let him use an fMRI scanner and he put people in the scanner and asked them to make difficult decisions about hypothetical moral situations. And um, for those of you who are philosophers, these are variants on the trolley problem. For those of you who aren't, basically what they did is they asked people to consider situations in which they had to choose between uh, sacrificing one person to save many or doing nothing and letting the many perish. Um, there are all kinds of fancy ways of, of cashing this out. Uh, and he, Green, proposed a dual process theory that in the past 15 years has spawned, it's not even a cottage industry anymore, it's more like a small village of um, researchers who are trying to uh, build on or critique his theory. And so I'll talk a little bit about that because I think it matches up with the initial um, version of neuroscience and dual process theories that Evans proposes. And then move to a more recent approach by uh, independently, I think, Fiery Cushman and Mo Molly Crockett, who are largely sympathetic with Green's work, but have a very different way of trying to explain what's going on. So Green actually gives an account that is completely consistent with a very strong version of System 2, System 1, and emphasizes conflict between the systems. So the idea is that when you're watching the train speed down the track to those five people who've been tied to the track, and again, this is a philosophy talk, we don't ask how they got there. Um, you're trying to decide whether to divert the train onto a track that has only one person tied to the track or not. Uh, and he says that um, when we do that, we make a straightforward calculation that it's better to save five lives than to save one life, and the math wins. Uh, we generally, uh, and I do this with my undergrads all the time, they're all perfectly willing to pull the lever let the one person be run over by the train in order to save the five. But Green also gives a, another classic version of that dilemma in which you see the five people tied to the track, but you happen to be standing on a bridge over the track next to a really large person, and your option is not to pull a lever and have the train diverted, it's to actually push the person off the bridge. And again, my undergrads and all kinds of philosophers and supposed normal folk are really reluctant to do this. So you get a situation in which the vast majority of people are comfortable pulling the switch, the vast majority of people are not comfortable pushing somebody to their death, and yet the outcomes are the same. You either let one person die or let five people die. So Green um, describes what happens in these two scenarios in terms of two kinds of responses. In the first scenario where you're pulling the switch, you have a set of emotional responses or, or valences tied to different possible outcomes. 
And he describes these as currency emotions because they add value to the different outcomes. In his later work, he, he published a book a couple of years ago, he talks about this in, in terms of manual mode. So uh, those who are photographers know that you can do sort of the point and shoot with a, a good camera or you can switch it to manual mode and set things for, for yourself. And so he draws on that analogy to describe the kind of thinking that goes on when we contemplate pulling the lever to um, overriding the, or to, to engaging manual mode. By contrast, the thought of pushing somebody off of a bridge results in what Green calls an emotional alarm bell, which he says is like an automatic setting on a camera. It's the default, it just happens. Um, and again, I don't want to say too much about this, but uh, you may know that he actually makes some really strong claims about the implications of this for moral theory. He thinks one reflects utilitarianism, which is one of the two big moral theories, and that the other reflects the ontology. So he's gotten a lot of attention among philosophers, uh, not just philosophers of science or philosophers of mind, but also ethicists who want to argue against the normative conclusions that he draws. But for my purposes, Uh, all right. oh, there we go. Uh, I want to point out that, again, his idea that we have this really strong emotional response to the thought of pushing somebody that we just don't have when we think about just killing them by running them over with a train because we're standing back here and just have to pull the lever. He says we have an evolutionarily conserved tendency to refrain from harming others. He describes it as partially innate. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, but he says that it's very likely that we humans have inherited many of our social tendencies from our primate ancestors, among them instincts that rein in the tendencies of individuals to harm one another. So like our primate ancestors, pushing people uh, is not a good thing. We don't want to push people into harm's way. Uh, but as, as he puts it in, I think, this same paper, we have not evolved a tendency to refrain from harming people by pulling levers and running them over with trains. So whereas we have this strong emotional alarm bell response to pushing, we don't have it to the switch dilemma. And again, this is very much a strong version of system two. So I put the little red arrows to indicate uh, the specific characteristics that Green has said that our alarm bell response <coughs> has, uh, it's evolutionarily old and shared with animals, it's unconscious or pre-conscious, it's implicit, it's automatic, it's fast, it's intuitive. And the other thing that he says is that it can't be changed by experience, we cannot integrate it into our decision making, we have to override it with our system two conscious, slow, effortful response. So he then ties this to the brain. And again, he had originally done a couple of imaging studies setting up this um, distinction. He's backed away from the imaging quite a bit lately and is doing more um, behavioral uh, work. So stuff that is actually, I think, much more in line with the other literature in dual processing theories, looking at the, uh, or the effects of different um, timing, of uh, varying the task slightly. But even in the book, so fairly recently, he's explicit that his so-called manual mode, or his system two, is not an abstract thing. It's a set of neural networks. It's based primarily in the prefrontal cortex. And he says specifically that it's associated with activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate. And by contrast, automatic emotional responses are enabled by the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So there's some work showing that people with damage to the VMPFC are perfectly willing to push people off the bridge. So I think that's wrong. And if anybody is fascinated by this, I've written a whole paper in which I belabor this for many pages. Um, I'm just going to assume that I've convinced you all that it's wrong or that you didn't need convincing in the first place. Uh, and I want to turn instead to this possible alternative explanation of what's going on, not behaviorally, because I think that's pretty clear, but in the brain. So in two papers, both published in 2013, but again independently, Fiery Cushman and Molly Crockett have suggested that a better way of understanding the dual processing in the neuroscience of moral judgment is not the strict system one, system two approach that Green adopts, but what they 
call model-based versus model-free evaluation. And they're drawing here on literature that originally occurred in um, machine learning and computational neuroscience. Uh, Crockett talks a little bit more about animal research. There's been a little bit of imaging research in humans. The key thing is that we can use this as an alternative to the alarm bell versus currency emotion approach that Green has talked about. So model-based evaluation, uh, as Crockett puts it, constructs a causal model of the world creating a forward-looking decision tree representing the contingencies between actions and outcomes and the value of those outcomes. So for those of you who are decision theorists, you can just picture the tree. For the rest of us, just think about imagining different possible outcomes. If I pull the switch, this will happen. If I don't pull the switch, this will happen. And we assign value to those outcomes. Cushman points out that this focuses on the consequences of our actions rather than the actions themselves, so it allies with what Green considers to be utilitarian decision making. And then by contrast, model-free evaluation, and here I'm quoting Cushman, um, builds sparse representations of the value of each action available in a particular state, and it only assesses the, action, the value of actions that are immediately available. Another way of looking at this is to say that model-based evaluation looks into the future, and model-free evaluation just looks at the next step. And again, Cushman thinks that this allies with the deontological response of not pushing somebody off of a bridge in front of a speeding train. So with this distinction in mind, we can talk about how their approach differs from and is similar to Green's theory. I think that the model-based evaluation is very similar to Green's cognitive system or manual mode. The idea is that we really are thinking about the different possibilities and weighing which ones we think are the most valuable and uh, most worth trying to bring about. But it's very different in terms of how the model-free system uh, uh, works compared to Green's emotional alarm bell. And it also is different in terms of the relationship between the two systems. And I just want to focus, I think, on the differences. So for Green, the alarm bell has an inflexible response. It's dedicated, it's automatic, it has the characteristics of type one processes. And again, it doesn't change. So he says in several places that in order to overcome our aversion to pushing the person off of the bridge in front of the train, we have to override the alarm bell. It doesn't diminish as we calmly think about what our options are. Model-free evaluation, by contrast, inherently involves learning. So we update the values associated with alternative actions based on reinforcement. So there's a flexibility in model-free evaluation that just doesn't occur in Green's um, theory. And I think this is actually really useful for dual process theory more broadly because it allows for a variety of kinds of type one processes. So um, circumstances in which we learn, an or we learn a response very well. We overlearn it so that it becomes automatic or intuitive. Um, it, it gives us a much broader range of possible types of automatic, intuitive, fast responses. The second issue that I think is, is useful thank you, is that uh, the model-based, model-free uh, contrast in includes integration between the processes. So type one processes can influence type two processing. Uh, they can provide input into broader uh, type two processes. So unlike Green's alarm bell, which just happens but doesn't enter into the negotiations that occur when you're working with currency emotions, uh, we can have these type one processes get incorporated into our broader decision making um, processes. It also works the other way around. So type two processing, slow, deliberate, conscious processing, can actually influence type one processing. And the example here, and this comes from Cushman's paper, is of fictive reward. So this is an experimental circumstance in which people are given two choices. They make a choice, they get a reward, but they're also told that if they had chosen the alternative, they would have gotten a greater reward. 
and they have suggested that um, the type 1 processing, the uh, association between the action that wasn't taken and the value assigned to that action actually gets updated based on this verbal feedback. So you don't actually have to experience the reward in order to have it change what you will do in the next uh, round of, um, of, of choice in the experiment. And this is really interesting because it allows for the shaping of type 1 intuitive or automatic processes by type 2 processes, uh, which are more, again, abstract and um, involved in theoretical uh, musings and deliberations. So with that possible alternative way of understanding type 1 and type 2 processing in hand, I'm going to go back and look at these two questions again. So first of all, what kind of cognitive taxonomy is suggested by work on dual process theories? Again, the talk of necessary or essential characteristics makes me feel kind of uncomfortable, but I think that this is probably, in broad brushstrokes, the best way to approach things. That there are certain characteristics that are not definitive necessarily, but at least strongly suggestive that a type one thing is going on. Again, the model free processing. Um, or a type 2 model based <coughs> is going on. And the way that I think that this actually improves on the initial family resemblance approach, but without getting into the problems faced by the strong account of two systems, is that it actually is explanatory rather than purely descriptive. We can talk about what's going on in the brain, we can give an account of how the processing actually works. But again, we're not committed to the strong evolutionary account. And the second question, how might dual process theories be realized at the level of neural function? So this is where the rank speculation starts. Um, and those of you who think it started at the beginning of the talk, that's okay, I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the part where I'm willing to cop to actually speculating. Um, so Kristen said this morning that we should not think in terms of where, we should think in terms of how things are happening. I've used what rather than how, and I think that there's probably, we're probably gesturing in the same general direction. Uh, instead of thinking about where the type 1 processes are and where the type 2 processes are, we can think about what's going on in the brain when these kinds of, um, uh, of choices are being made. So one way in which this is helpful to us is that the uh, learning theory looks at activity in the basal ganglia that's associated with reward, whereas as Green points out, the um, possibility of uh, pushing somebody in a train, in front of a train, is associated with activity in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So we have two very different areas of the brain that um, are doing possibly very similar kinds of processing. And then I want to go back to, just to finish, Evans's 2009 paper, the one in which I think he's actually making a better job of explaining how the neuroscience of dual process theories uh, might cash out. He says, there may not be any stable version of system two at all, just a set of interacting units, including <coughs> working memory, which for him is again the defining characteristic, that get activated to deal with a particular task. So this is another way in which the sort of system two type two level we can move away from where and start looking at what's actually going on. And I've been reading Mike's book lately, and I'm trying to figure out how that fits with some of this. Um, I, I can get back to you in a year or two, maybe. <laughs> um, but I think that that is it for today. Thank you very much.
I don't think anybody has actually tested it, but here's some behavioral evidence that might be useful. Um, it turns out that people who are card-carrying utilitarians, like one of my former colleagues, uh, do give utilitarian responses, and they give them quickly, and they give them automatically, and they give them consistently. Dale is not a psychopath, he does not have brain damage. So it's entirely, I think a plausible way of, of understanding this is that he has just become so accustomed to utilitarian thinking that his alarm bell is not active anymore. Uh, or that his model free system is uh, not attaching the same kind of uh, value to the thought of pushing somebody. Nice, okay. Thank you, that, that's really helpful. But then it's not, it's this problem of, like, is, is localization a problem? Is that when we assign one region to having one specific function, we're, we're, we're uh, making that for, we're invoking that for stronger? Is that just this, like, this model free model based reinforcement learning has been due? Yeah, I think that's right, and I think that Largely, the answer to that is more sort of a, a broadly construed disciplinary answer rather than uh, this is what the evidence is, that we're just all working within a framework in which we assume that there's going to be localization. So that's how people will tend to interpret this kind of data rather than thinking you know, sort of bottom up about what's actually going on in the brain rather than sort of top down. We have these cognitive processes. They must occur somewhere. Question. Sure. Um, so when I'm reading this stuff, I often find it difficult to know what people like Evans mean by a system. Yes. So when, particularly when you start thinking about neuro instantiations, it seems like when I want to think about a system, I want to think of something that's doubly dissociable. Right. 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 Can you find a double dissociation for it? Then there seems to be two distinct systems. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't seem like the right sort of thing that you're going to be looking for. Yeah. It would be very funny to find that you could do, and I seem to suggest from the quote there, that they're not really talking about it. It would be funny to find somebody who could do all the system two or type two yeah. stuff. And none of the type one. type one. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that's absolutely right. So what do you think they're thinking? Like, well, this is something I was talking about with somebody else who works on this stuff a while ago. What do you think they might actually mean by a system? Yeah, and this is why, sort of when I was trying to cash out the idea that you know they have this strong view of systems that really most of what they're saying is that well we don't actually mean that thing that you think that we're meaning um, and I, I really don't think that anybody has given a really clear explanation of that that they're willing to stand behind and I think you know some people will use systems and processes more or less interchangeably um, so it's it's really just a mess. Yes, I wasn't sure what, what you meant by saying that you were sympathetic to the sort of essence or necessary feature of you. I mean, were you going back to endorsing um, what uh, Evans says about either working memory involving or not, or what Stanovich says either automatic or not? Because it seems to if, it, if that's all that's meant. That, if those are the defining features for Adams and Stanovich, respectively, for type 1 uh, versus type 2, then it seems to actually uh, gut it of a lot of explanatory value. Because I mean, we always knew that some processes involve working memory and some processes don't. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is to tell, if, if you can tell me, oh, the ones that involve working memory, guess what? They're the evolution review, they're the slow, they're the non-automatic, and so on. Right. Uh, but otherwise, if, if that's all there is to it, they're not really saying anything more. Yeah, yeah. So I think I have two answers to your question. Um, one of them is just that, you know, as a philosopher of science, I'm very much an instrumentalist. I think that we can model the same phenomenon in different ways and learn important things about it, and that it's not necessarily going to be the case that one of those ends up being the right way. 
So when we talk about essential characteristics or necessary characteristics, that's just a step further than I'm willing to take in general. Um, the second answer is that, of course, there's a huge literature on what counts as an explanation. So tr traditionally, we have kind of the um, law-based or later on unificationist approaches to understanding cause. And you know, maybe <coughs> the original type one versus type two literature that just lays out a list of characteristics is explaining something in that sense. But I think what we really want is something more like a causal explanation. And in order to do that, as you say, we really need to make stronger claims about what's going on. Uh, I don't think that the evolutionary approach is, is very helpful because I think not only is it a, a way more evolutionary psychology in the sort of broad, big capital letter evolutionary, capital letter psychology that um, I'm comfortable with, but also it leaves out things like learned uh, automatic intuitive responses. So it's, I think, much stronger uh, an explanatory framework than we can use. The third possibility, of course, and this goes back to Samuel's characterizing the systems as mechanisms, is that we can go with sort of the full Craver mechanistic explanation thing. Um, and I haven't really thought enough about how that's going to work, but it seems like possibly the model-based model for distinction is at least starting to get at something like that. I don't know if either of those answers were satisfying. There's a more comment that I'd like to get your thoughts on. <coughs> Just listening to this, one of the things that I realize is there, there, I wonder if there's an interesting still remaining kind of dualism going on here, right? So I think that most of the, the features that you're listing as being part of the taxonomy and, mm -hmm. and ways of understanding these things are, are, are psychological features. In some cases, are historical ones. Right. Right. Uh, none of and none of those are computational or neural features. Yes. Right. And so the mapping gets reduced to just some simple. Well, there must be a brain system for it. Yeah. But we're never we're not getting to anything about real implementation. Right. right? These these are psychological or again historical features that are meant to give us some kind of predictive uh, hold mm -hmm. on why we can understand and explain why the behavior turned out that way. Right. Um, and then it looks to me like adding it, you've been talking about the, the underlying neural implementation doesn't give you anything. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right, that we start with sort of a description of the phenomena, and um, one of the, the slides actually had this, well, of course, there must be an implementational difference quote, that the assumption is, and I mean, I don't think it's a, a, a terrible assumption, it's just not one that we were able to catch up, but there's got to be a neural difference. I mean, that seems to me to be trivial true, trivially true in some sense. Um, but whether these kinds of characteristics are the right sorts of things to go looking for in the brain just yeah, doesn't seem to offer yeah, and, I, and I wonder then also, if we were to get a better handle on the computations or however we want to talk about the, the, the in the neural architecture that give rise to these, is the explanatory target still the behaviors or is it these features? I think it would have to still be the behaviors. So um, what we're doing is, um, sort of getting rid of, or at least radically altering this list of features um, in a way that is more true of what's going on in the brain. Um, that, you know, and, and again, I mean, I want to be a pluralist about this to a certain extent. It may be that some of the psychological uh, approaches are really useful for certain types of things that we want to do. So for example, if we want to look at uh, dual process theories of learning to inform education research, we might actually want to go with something like this, minus the evolutionary baggage. Uh, but if what we're interested in is explaining the reasoning, then I, I don't think this is actually going to be terribly useful. Yeah, I guess this is also a comment <clears throat> rather than a question, but one thing I, I found really cool about the talk is that in a lot of the talk about psychological taxonomies or cognitive ontologies, it's, yeah, I kind of imagine a branching tree of constructs, you know, working memory, passive switching, and anger, and, and this kind of thing. But there are these like psychological, like error constants, you know, like perceptual, or, right. or system two, or, or motoric, or things like that, that are supposed to cover 
you know, vaster branches, you know, large swaths of the right. tree. So anyway, I just wanted to comment that it's really interesting that this isn't a debate about a particular construct, but a debate about this kind of higher, almost what's yeah. almost what would be like higher level taxonomic kind of taxonomic kind of like, you know, mammal as opposed to right, right, or like yeah. That. But I think that's interesting. I'll let us put it Yeah, thank you. That that's really helpful. Um, so if anybody's actually read the abstract that I submitted, what actually got me interested in this question and in the context of dual process theories is that we have a situation in which the same content is being processed in very different ways and we don't always have a good explanation for why that happens. And so um, I, I just, I think that that's a really interesting issue to be looking at in general and, and the level of explanation I think is a really nice way of sort of thinking about that. Um, I just have a, a question on kind of a larger, more general question on how to categorize uh, Greek taxonomies. I, I wonder, I worry about uh, this kind of categorical binary mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in another con completely other context, this is one of the problems psychiatry Yes, yes. And, and I wonder what you might think, because it seems that these are, can all be dimensionalized. And I worry that if we dichotomize them, then we start getting into this, well, at what point does something become fast and slow? Right. And then where do we place it? Yes. And so, so I guess the, the real concern is reification. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if I have a big question about this, but I'm wondering, how how you see that. Yeah, and this is actually something that I still haven't quite wrapped my mind around, but um, uh, this idea that we have to draw a distinction between processes, which are type one and type two, and modes of processing, which are your personal tendency to use type two thinking versus my personal tendency to use type two thinking. I mean, it, it, I think that's exactly compatible with what you're saying, that these are actually a dimension. Um, so I guess, and I don't think this answers your question, but I guess what people are, are doing is saying that the experimental manipulations are evidence that they are two distinct systems. So for example, um, if we ask you to do math problems while you're making social judgments or moral judgments, you're much more likely to go with the fast intuitive responses than with the thoughtful responses. And, and this is taken to be an indication that the slow, thoughtful responses share some kind of processing capacity with your extraneous task, whereas these other things are just the automatic response of a completely independent system. And, and again, I, I mean, this seems, I mean, it's really well accepted that there are these two kinds of processes, but you certainly could say that really it's much more fruitful to think about it dimensionally. Well, I think everybody's ready for their drink. All so. right. <laughs>